Hey guys, this is April, and today I've decided to talk about Mayonnaise Olympia. So I'm going to try to be as comprehensive as possible with this work. So there's going to be some things, if you heard about this painting, that is familiar, and hopefully some things that is new to you. Now, Mayonnaise Olympia, unlike Luncheon on the Grass, was actually accepted into the official Salon show. So the salon show was the major show that if you wanted to make a living off of your career in the arts, you wanted to be accepted into this exhibition. It was overseen by the Academy and at this point had a very conservative jury. The jurors were more interested in keeping up with academic tradition rather than showing work that was revolutionary or different from the norm. Now, like Manet's Luncheon on the Grass, Olympia was a very controversial painting. A lot of people felt it was distasteful, and there were a couple of big reasons why. First was people did not like how it was painted. To people, it looked unfinished. There are a lot of areas that are very rough as far as the paint application. People also disliked the cramped composition. You really don't feel much depth within the piece. Another thing that people criticized was how Manet's Olympia was painted. When you look at her flesh tone, she looks washed out. She has very little value transition in her flesh tones. This is going against academic tradition. Another thing that people did not like as well is Olympia's figure. They felt that she was too skinny. When it comes to beauty at this time, people wanted a little, you know, a little fat on their women. They wanted them to be curvy. Olympia almost looks like a teenager, so that was not tasteful as well. The other major thing that people strongly disliked was the subject matter and how it was approached in this piece. Now, Olympia is a name that was very popular among prostitutes. Now, prostitutes were not out of the norm when it comes to art at this time point. I mean, technically, you had odalisques in the salon, and odalisques are harem girls. You also have prostitution being reflected in William Hogarth's work. That was a very popular subject matter when it comes to his prints and paintings. In Manet's Olympia, though, the big difference with her compared to how other nudes are depicted is she's not submissive. One great work to compare this to, and Manet is making a correlation to this painting, is Titian's Venus of Urbino. In Titian's painting, his female form is submissive. The way that she turns her face away from the viewer makes her more approachable. The way that she has her hand across her crotch is elegant yet tempting at the same time. She also has a dog beside her feet, signifying that she is a loyal woman. A dog is a symbol of fidelity, so it makes the subject a bit more appropriate for the audience. When it comes to Manet's Olympia, though, her face is looking straight at you. That makes her unapproachable. It makes her uneasy to be around. When you see someone who you're not familiar with or just acquaintance and they're staring straight at you, you tend to get some chills up your spine. It's not something that we tend to like to encounter just naturally. Another thing that people would have noticed and not like is the position of her hand. She has a firm grasp over her crotch. It conveys that she has control over her body. She dictates who has the power in this sexual relationship. She's not submissive. The last thing that is significantly different between Manet's figure and Titian's figure is Manet's figure has clothes on her. So that accentuates the idea that this is not a beautiful nude, this is not a goddess, this is not a muse, this is a real woman, this is a prostitute. So it exaggerates the fact because she actually has clothes on. Very nice ones, to say the least, as well. So she is not just a prostitute, but she makes some good money off of it. One other thing that Manet has done is gone way out of his way to make sure that the viewers knew that this was a prostitute. The symbolism is absolutely blatant. I've already mentioned the name, but there's a couple of other things that are signifiers that she has a questionable occupation. That is the servant, the bouquet of flowers, and the cat. 
when it comes to cats, they have symbolized lust ever since ancient Roman times. Also, when it comes to the flowers, flowers ever since the Renaissance, and probably even before then, were symbolic of sex. Since, well, a flower is essentially the reproductive organs of the plant. One of the interesting things about this scene is Olympia is essentially snubbing the bouquet, which is probably a gift from one of her clients. Some people have interpreted that you, the viewer, are like a guest that has barged into the scene. Now, we aren't sure for that. You know, that's one interpretation. But she seems a little dissettled or bitter about something. One last thing I want to cover about this painting are the models. The models are familiar to us. Uh, when it comes to the white woman, she was used previously in Manet's Luncheon on the Grass. This is Victorian. She was used by multiple artists as a model for their work. And she was an artist herself. She did paintings and she, even she got into the salon at times when Manet didn't. So she was a very talented artist. When it comes to the other woman, the black woman, she was also a model as well. Her name was Laura. Unfortunately, we don't have her last name. Now, when it comes to depicting her in this piece, it's not a positive image. The reason that she's in this piece is she's a symbol. She is symbolic of her being a prostitute. When it comes to Western depictions of prostitutes, the reason you see a lot of black servants is black people were viewed as being hypersexual in the past. This was not a controversial idea whatsoever, and this was not something that people complained about. One sign that the artist, Manet, viewed this black woman questionably, even though it's hard to see these days, is the clothing. Manet has put this black woman, Laura, in an outdated dress. Ever since the Renaissance, if you wanted to know if someone was naughty or an evil person or had some problem with their lifestyle, you'd look at the clothes. If their clothing is out of date, if it's like 100 years old, out of fashion, that was a negative symbol towards that individual. I find it interesting that I had to go way out of my way to find this information out, to find out the racism within this piece. If you go to most lectures or look at most art history textbooks, you're lucky if she's even mentioned, which is pretty sad. For example, I have this textbook, this art history survey textbook that's over a thousand pages long and doesn't even mention or acknowledge her presence. This same textbook also only dedicates less than one page to the Harlem Renaissance as well. So if this is something that concerns you or alarms you, you might consider writing a stern letter to these textbook companies like Pearson to take more of an effort to discuss these issues of race because there's actually a lot of opportunity in our history to do so. Well, I'm going to stop ranting now. If you guys have any questions or comments, leave them down below.